I wasn't sure what to call this video. I decided on Barry Harris half step rules workout session or something like that. I have here Barry Harris, who is this famous piano player and educator, his half step rules. We're going to apply that to uh, Bob scales. You should probably know what Bob scales are. And we're going to use all this stuff over the tune Maiden Voyage by Herbie Hancock. It's not a lesson on how to play over Maiden Voyage necessarily. We're just using that chord progression. At first, you're going to notice if you know what Bob scales are, if you watch my previous videos, for example, you will find that it's uh, the same thing at first, but stick around because later on in the video, uh, we will expand on this idea, this concept, add more stuff to it and uh, connect it with other stuff. I'm also going to make an argument that you can use this stuff over several different chords, several different uh, situations, if you will. So if it's too easy for you at first, you can print out this PDF. If you're a Patreon, you can print out the PDF and uh, play along and look at it as a warm up exercise at first. So seven pages of this stuff, so much to cover. Let's just get right into it, shall we? So the first rule, this is over a dominant chord. So the first chord of Maiden Voyage is D7. Hang on, you're saying it's a D sus chord. Yeah, but uh, as you will see, if you stay with me, bear with me, we can, these chords are up for grabs. We can think of it as a D7. It's better to think of it for what we're doing now. Think of the first chord as a D7. The first rule is if a line starts on the tonic, third, fifth, or flat seventh, there must be a half step between the tonic and the seventh. So there you go. It's basically a bob scale. So if I'm starting on a tonic, D7, that's a dominant scale or a mixolydian scale. There must be a half step between the tonic and the seventh. It doesn't matter that the chord is a sus chord. So maybe I should explain a little bit the theory behind the sus chord. So the real book says C over D, I think, which goes to an F sus, which is E flat triad over F. And it's going back and forth between those two chords, right? But this chord, the C over D, which we jazz musicians call the sus chord, could be other things. It could be an A minor chord over D. There are many ways you can create that sus sound. It could be a C major 7 over D. Right? Something people think that you can't include the F sharp, but you can if you put it on top. G as well. That's a sus chord. So this scale, the one I'm showing you, the, the dominant scale works over both those things. But for now, let's just think of it as a D7. So I got my iReal Pro here, made in Voyage, Jazz, Even Eights, and I'm gonna play this scale over every chord. That's the first exercise. So here we go. Even though the chord, the lovely piano in the iReal Pro is playing a sus chord, this, this still works. Now, 
I just want to mention that this is not a lesson on how to play over Maiden Voyage. This classic Herbie Hancock tune is a kind of an impressionistic tune. It is, uh, if you listen to the recording, which you should, obviously, the way they play, it's very loose and there are a lot of interaction going on and they're kind of painting at this picture over the chords, modal. So they're not running scales up and down. So you're not, if you go to a gig and you play Maiden Voyage and start playing scales up and down, no, that, that's not a way, the way to approach that tune. But however, it's a perfect chord progression. We're just borrowing the chord progression as a vehicle for this uh, stuff I'm showing you now, the Barry Harris half-step rules. So you're thinking also, I think, some of you, well, that chord after the E flat sus, this is C sharp minor nine. Well, that's exactly my point. That's an F sharp sus. And C sharp minor, it's the same thing. It's the same scales, the same chord just different bass notes. Imagine if I'm playing the C sharp minor nine, the bass player plays an F sharp. Well, there you have it. It's a F sharp sus. So it's basically D sus to F sus, D sus to F sus, and then up a half step, E flat to F sharp sus. The only thing is that the bass note is different there. And then there's an A section again. So another reason why we're picking a chord progression from an actual tune, an actual composition, as opposed to just a random chord progression, we could come up with any sus chord progression, right? Some people have this idea that it's better to use an actual composition, an actual tune. I remember Scott Henderson, when I studied with him, he didn't like the idea of just practicing over random chord progressions. I, I want to remember that he always mentioned it's better to work on an actual tune. So many reasons for that. First off, you're killing several birds with one stone, right? You're practicing the tune that you would probably actually play. So you're memorizing the chord changes. And, but deeper than that, you're playing something that is part of jazz history, a chord progression that has some kind of canon to it and some kind of meaning to it, as opposed to, I mean, Herbie put a lot of thoughts into this and this is a classic, jazz composition that has a place in the jazz history and all that. So it gives you hopefully more inspiration than just a random chord progression. So I hope that makes sense. So now we're going to do the same thing, but I'm going to start on the third. The half step is at the same place, right? Just between the tonic and the seventh. So it sounds like this. Noticing also that I'm kind of lazy right now. I'm just moving the same shape. Obviously, you should be able to play these scales in every position and all over the fretboard if you're a guitar player. I just can't focus on every aspect of this because the video would go on forever, so I have to limit myself. So I'm not talking about that in this video. I'm just kind of hoping that you understand that you will have to practice these scales in several positions. Now to prove my point, that this works over several chords, I'm gonna do this kind of reversed. I'm gonna play the same phrase. Now loop it. So this works over D sus, right? But it also works over D7. combination of could be that kind of thing or A minor or A minor to 
27. A 2-5. Could be oil pummel ba. It's kind of hard to play along with the loop there. All this stuff I'm going to show you, all these lines, work over all those chords. Those chords are kind of interchangeable or up for grabs, is that the expression? That hopefully will make you realize how you can use the same stuff over many situations. We'll get back to that. All right, so the next Barry Harris rule. I got this uh, PDF from the internet. It's uh, eddyrichmusic.com. I just found it. Eddie Rich, I think he's a sax player from Las Vegas or something like that. All right, so rule number two. If a line starts on the third, the fifth, or the flat seventh, there can be a sequence of half steps from three to two, two to one, one to flat seven. So let me say that again. If you're starting on the third of D7, F sharp, I can go chromatically to the next note, to the next note, just adding a basically just adding more chromaticism. So this is the same thing as a 10 note bob scale. So the idea of the bob scale, right, is to play chord tones or diatonic notes on strong beats and passing notes on the weak beats. So So let's try that try that over the same progression made in voyage. Here we go. could also start on the fifth. Or the flat seventh. I really like this one. excellent for double time, developing double time lines. You can play this twice as fast, the 16th notes, right? Same, same principle. So I like to find a tempo that I can barely play 16th notes when I practice this stuff. And then I'll set the, the iReal Pro slightly below that tempo. And then, you know, there's a function where you can increase. So every chorus, you increase the speed by a small increment. And then that's a great way to practice your double time lines. So this line, for example. So it's a... You could call it the 10 note bob scale, or you could call it the Barry Harris half step rules number two. Well, obviously you can play the ascending as well. Should. I'm just playing them descending for the sake of this video so that it doesn't go on forever. So imagine that this could also be A minor. If you take the tune Recordame, the 
as A minor to C minor. That's, those are the same, the same harmonic structure as this two. So the stuff I just played works over record on A as well. And you could play it over the other chords as well if you treat the 2-5. Remember, it's the same thing. So if I play that tune, uh, two, three, uh, Instead of going C, B, A, you could go add even more chromaticism and go B, B flat, A. Starting on the ninth instead, right? So I want you to realize, I want you to discover that you can change this thing, these things and incorporate it in stuff you already know and mix it around and try different, uh, add your own ideas to it. Don't just play these ideas the way I have them written out for you, but explore, change things around, right? So this brings me to that next point, which is now, remember, we're starting on the root or the third, the fifth or the flat seventh of the dominant chord, the D7. So regardless if it's an A minor, or D sus or whatever, I'm thinking D7 and starting on those notes. Now this obviously, what I mean is we're starting on a downbeat. So you start on beat one or two or three or four. You don't have to start on beat one, start on beat two, but it should be a downbeat. Let's start on beat two. The first thing we did was that. Sus, anticipating, which is a really good thing to do. Bring, it gives you that forward motion, which is like a magical jazz word. But you don't want to start on an upbeat because then the whole thing, the whole idea of strong beat, chord tone goes out the window. So then it becomes uh, the opposite, which is really not good. But what if you want to start on the upbeat? Well, then you start on any of the other notes. We have remaining notes. If we can start on the root, third, fifth, or the seventh, well, if I start on the, on the ninth, I can start on an upbeat. Then it starts like this. many times before volume three inside improvisation series jazz line by Jerry Brigonzi this book explains all this stuff in detail I have never seen any any more comprehensive Bob scale book than this one so any possible combination of where you, what note you can start on and how you can use these Bob scales you can't find a better book or maybe you can, I haven't seen a better book than this one. So I strongly recommend that. I've talked about this book many times before. Because now, let's say you want to start on the ninth of D. Well, that is a thing you can do where you can just don't play that half step. 
then it's gonna add up, right? So if I... That works. Sounds like this. Starting on the ninth. continue into the next octave I have to play the bop scale or the half step okay so why do we practice this well it's a beginner thing to always start on the downbeat always start on the chord tone and very much beginner thing to always start on the roots so you want to practice starting on every possible note but this system enables you to still outline the harmony the scale you're playing is still outlining the harmony even though you can start over uh, with any note and there's also this thing that ultimately you want to be able to connect your lines over the changes as the changes happen so let's say you play a phrase and then you land on a note and it's a new chord you want to be able to just continue your line regardless of what that note is in relation to the new chord. That's why it's good to be able to start on any note and just keep playing into the new scale. There are other ways you can do this. You could, uh, this for example, starting on the, the ninth of D7, you could play chromatic scale down to C. However, you can't do that with the G starting on the fourth row. There are other ways you could do. Another thing you could do is think of this tune. Starts with a bop scale, a major bop scale. There's a little ornament there. So if I play a non chord tone like B, for example, I can do that little ornamentation. And then I'm in the bop scale. you could explore with this stuff I just have to move on here okay now we're getting into some interesting stuff chromatic scale Barry Harris chromatic scale and again I'm gonna refer to my favorite or one of my favorite YouTube channels things I learned from Barry Harris this could be the fourth video that I refer to that channel and he's okay with it so that's a good thing, right? So if you haven't checked out things I learned from Barry Harris, you should do that. It's a great channel. And I, I saw one of his videos and I'll link to it where he explained this stuff. So how should I best explain this? Imagine a D dominant scale. Mixolydian scale, right? There are two half steps in this scale between the F sharp and the G and the B and the C. So anytime there is a whole step, you play the chromatic note between the whole step. Between the D and E, between the E and F sharp. Now you have a half step. So you can't do that. So instead you go a note above it, A, G. So the A is above the G, right? And then you continue. above the next note. All right, so here it is. And then you can keep going like that. Right? So it's pretty crazy. I have practiced jazz and studied jazz for over 30 years. 
I have never heard of this until I watched this video. It's a completely new thing to me and it's that just goes to show what a brilliant mind Barry Harris is. He is actually alive, right? So, and uh, yeah, it's just mind-blowing because this system kind of enables you to still do that, outlining the harmony and still play chromatic stuff, but still outline the harmony because if you're just playing chromatic notes randomly, you know, you're not, doesn't make any sense in relation to the chord you're on. Not saying you can't do that. Sometimes we all play chromatic stuff. If you like me are a Django Reinhardt fan, you'll know that we love the chromatic scale, right? But this is more sophisticated than just playing chromatic scales up and down. And the joke, you know, is that if a jazz musician is lost, they start playing chromatic stuff, which is basically a bunch of BS playing BS, right? So, so we're gonna do the reverse, the mirror of that. We're gonna start on D. time or every time there's a half step which is here between the C and B we do the mirror play the D so it's kind of a mirror image of what we played ascending so what we'll do let's start on the third starting on the third. Sounds like a bebop lick, right? Let's do that over Maiden Voyage. Here we go. trying to play some fancy stuff that didn't work. So you should start on different notes. I'm just uh, starting on the third there, but you can start on other notes as well and try the same idea. Okay, so now this got me thinking, hmm, this sounds familiar. It's that bebop cliche, right? The Dave, thank you, David Baker. If you follow my videos, you know what I'm talking about. I'm thinking, could I replace that? What should we call it? The jumping off note. It doesn't have to be that note, right? It could be uh, basically any other note. I wouldn't abandon the same concept if I changed that note. What if I change it to an E? Now we get the thank you, David Baker, the Bach cliche, even more. So I'm finishing off with that. Thank you, David Baker. David Baker is this famous jazz book author and educator, right? Who talks about this phrase. So let's try that. Let's see what do we have. That was gonna sound good for sure. fast to do for me to do double time right now so I would decrease the tempo a little bit and then 
slowly bring it up and then try to increase my double time chops. What if I change it to an even uh, larger interval? To an, it's like an octave displacement. Then it sounds like a George Benson lick. Have you heard George Benson play that lick? That's a famous George Benson lick. So it's the same idea, same print, it's just that it's a larger interval. I remember I had a friend who heard that lick. He was like, could you figure out what that is? I don't, what is that that George Benson is playing? So then I will have this. How I'm mixing in this stuff with I'm mixing it with stuff that I already know and I encourage you to do the same if you have bop licks see if you can find these patterns and if you can incorporate these half step rules with bop licks that you already have so I'm just gonna play this same lick here for you can we do? You know what else it reminds me of? It reminds me of this. So that's a diminished thing, like a half whole lick. So that's a diminished, it's like I'm targeting the C up the diminished interval or the minor third and then I target the A which is the next chord tone target the F sharp and target the flat 9 that you could be back in the bop scale there so So you could go in and out of that tonality with uh, symmetrical diminished and that might seem like a weird thing but not really people play that scale over dominant chords all the time even if it's a sus chord it's like you do this right like imagine an intro you're playing a tune in, in g starting on the d pedal d sus and then you go like this triad so that comes from the symmetrical diminished the half whole scale I hear people do that all the time so you could go in and out of those scales uh, see what I let's see what I wrote here let's try that This is the half whole. I have a video on the diminished scale where I show a whole bunch of licks like this. If you want to be fancy, you do a display octave displacement instead of playing the E flat there. You play that's a Birelli La Grand. I think I've heard Birelli La Grand play that lick. Uh, Just a variation, right? Let's do one more diminished lick. Again, if I'm landing on that, the, the key notes, the notes you want to target is or are the C, A, F sharp, and E flat. The diminished arpeggio that creates that D. 7 flat 9 chord. So 
So you can play any note from those notes. So I could, for example, go like this. Play a fourth from that note. as usual this is I'm afraid it's going to be a long video again I'll leave you with one more thing that you can do so there's another way you can play chromatic scales you don't have to play them like that you could play them there's a very common thing to do this so I'm just basically doing this right so with a way to a good fingering for this I do this and now I'm back to the regular it's like a trumpet thing yeah I hear it's like kind of reminds me of uh, something that uh, Randy Brecker would play let's try that that's the last example I promise pretty fast it, it sounds better if you play it fast but it's one of those things it can sound super cool right but it can also sound like you're playing you know a bunch of nonsense to be honest you can also do like a rant or Michael Brecker thing where it, it could play the same note so that's a lot of stuff to explore and try to incorporate that into your stuff so this is hopefully giving you ideas how to create lines. And remember that you can try these lines over a regular 2-5. If you think of a 2-5, like A minor to D7, just think D7. So if you have a, any standard that you're playing, that you're trying your bop lines, try this approach. You could do it over Cherokee or uh, any 2-5-1 bass tune. And hopefully this will give you a different approach to it all. So again, all this stuff is on my Patreon page. And thank you so much again to all my patrons. Appreciate it. And uh, let me know if this was useful. If you have any comments, I love to know, to hear from you guys, what you think. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next.